I'm live. I am live. How's that? How's this? Light. Why not? Hey, welcome, Bethany. Guys, can you hear me okay? Can you see me? Let me know in the chat. I think someday I will just have confidence that I'm here and that you can hear me, but I'm not there yet. Okay, guys, chat me up. Where are you from? And can you hear me most importantly? Okay, Bethany hears me. That's all that matters. All right, so welcome back to School of Support. This is number two. Last time we talked about basically, should you convert a schoolie? Should you build a mobile dwelling? To which the answer is always maybe. Today, I want to talk about basically, oh, okay. Mohammed, thanks for being here. San Antonio, Texas. I hear it's hot there. Slab City. And yes, Gun. And you can hear me. Sweet. Thank you guys. Thanks for chatting with me. It's uh it's nice to just hear where you're from and see what you have to say. Sherry, thanks. Thanks for coming back, Sherry. Thank you. Yeah, it's hot. Um, Charleston, South Carolina, this time of year, which is where we live, is brutal. Oh, you're probably wondering why I'm not in the bus right now. We are. I'm in a. I'm in a house right now. Our uh, my brother-in-law and his family and their kids. Uh, so Nova and River's cousins basically are staying in our bus right now at a campground. So they're living the bus life for a couple of days. I'm in a house. Um, good thing is I got Wi-Fi here. So um, that's where the bus is. Thanks. Oh, welcome back, Bob. Welcome back. Okay. So I want to get straight into it. And um, this is a simple, this is a super simple one. Basically, like, you know, you decided you're going to build a bus. And like the first question really is, which bus do I want? What am I looking for? And it turns out there's three options. You've got the dog nose or the conventional. This is the one that has like a, a front and the engines in the front and the wheels are in front of the driver. You have the front engine, which has a flat front. And the engine is right there with the driver. And the driver actually sits in front of the front wheels, which is cool. And then you've got the rear engine, which is the same body style as the front engine, except that the engine is all the way in the back of the bus. And we're going to talk about the pros and cons of each. But before, before we do that, we are going to talk about, I think, one of the most important decisions you have to make early. And you really need to think about this decision. And that is how long do you need your bus to be? Do you need a 40 footer? And what are you going to do with your bus and who's coming in it and where are you going? These are some of the most relevant questions to start out with because you could easily end up with a bus that's not right for you and have to switch out later or just bail because you didn't realize, you know, 40 foot is too much or a 25 is not enough. So I think when it comes to the length, there's a couple really important considerations. The first one is how much are you going to travel? If you are actually just building a home that you're never going to move, like maybe you're going to just you, you can get a shell of a bus for three grand, bring it off grid, bring a two piece of land and build a really cheap home in it. And if you're not going to move it at all, you should get the biggest bus that you can get to that piece of land. And um, if you're going to do that, you should also probably get a coach bus or a transit bus because they come with a lot more either headroom or storage. The transit bus, like an actual metropolitan transit bus has great headroom it makes for a much better long-term home than a schoolie which has sort of tight headroom and a coach bus has all these incredible storage compartments underneath but i sort of that's sort of a segue there um if you are going to be occasionally traveling in your bus like let's say that this is going to be your home and you're going to be in a rural area um, or just really anywhere except for dense city and maybe you're going to move it a couple of times the, uh, the length is not as much of a consideration. However, if you are going to be traveling full time, you probably don't want a 40 foot bus unless you have a very large family. Now, having said that, you can do most of the things that you could imagine you'd, we'd want to do with a 40 foot bus. We have a 40 foot bus. Our bus has the probably the longest wheelbase they make 
in a school bus. My head's too close. This is a little weird. Okay. Um, and I am constantly surprised by the ridiculous things I can do with this bus, um, having become experienced driving it. You can really maneuver it in alarming ways, especially if you're not, you know, if you're willing to like bother traffic around you in order to safely maneuver your bus around a turn or whatever you need to do, backing into somewhere, you can really do it. Um, but it sort of adds to your stress eventually. If you're doing a lot of crazy maneuvers every single day, a 40 foot bus all of a sudden starts to feel like a burden. And when we were traveling full time, we were on the roads for six months, probably moving almost every day. Um, sometimes we spent three to five days in a single location, but it's a lot of work to drive a bus. And it's a lot more work to drive a 40 foot bus than for example, Sam and Katie's 34 foot transit bus. That six feet, actually their bus, their bus has a really big front and rear bumper. So the body is actually only 32 and a half feet. And that bus is actually much easier to drive. It drives, you can, it drives like a car until, you know, you're doing 40 miles an hour and then it kind of slows down, but um, it's very maneuverable. The 40 footer with the huge wheelbase is not. So anyways, long winded answer, but you really don't want, basically, if you're traveling full time, you want the smallest bus that you could possibly imagine your family living in. If that's four kids and two adults, it's probably a 40 footer. It might be a 38 or 37 or 35 footer. If it's um, you guys and a kid, I would go 32, 35 or below. And um, if it's a couple, I would definitely be considering uh, basically buses on van chassis or um, shuttle buses or a just a, a short dog nose or front engine bus. Now, having said that, um, you're going to learn later which bus is my favorite. But you should know that if you're getting a rear engine bus, um, they really are hard to find under 35 feet. We found our wild caravan, that um, college shuttle bus, uh, which was 34 and a half feet. I haven't really seen many besides them, although um, one of our members in the chat last week has a Thomas Transit bus, uh, sorry, a Thomas school bus that is actually a 32 foot rear engine. So they do exist, um, but they're hard to find. Okay, so that being said, I wanna take a quick break. And um, if you guys have buses already or you're shopping right now or you've picked a bus, let me know in the chat which you picked and why you know if if we even put a ton of thought into it if you didn't it's fine some people just go for it and they make anything work but if you guys have a bus pop it in the chat what do you got dog nose front engine rear engine let me know and while you do that i'm going to start talking about the dog nose so the dog nose is the is also known as the conventional and um, it's where you have the engine in its own bay in front of the bus and the wheels are right underneath the engine and you are the you as the driver are right behind the wheels and the engine. So the pros to this, um, the first one is that it's kind of the most sensible bus in terms of engine repair and maintenance. The engine is all right there in front of you. You can get to it from the left and the right and underneath. You can get to it everywhere except for, you know, basically the back of the engine. Um, it has great ground clearance. For some reason, dog nose buses, they tend to have the best ground clearance. Um, you have a crumple zone. You've got an engine and a crumple zone for you as a driver to protect you in the case of an accident. Some people, you know, dog nose aesthetically, like that's their bus. Like those, um, there's some really cool looking dog nose buses. I like them a lot. For some reason, when I was bus shopping, I was like, I got to have that, that transit flat front you know, that's what I vibe with aesthetically, but there's some cool dog noses as well. Um, one downside is that you uh, you do have less interior space. So you've got the engine compartment. If you've got a 40 foot bus, a portion of that is made up by that engine compartment. So a 40 foot pusher is bigger interior significantly than a 40 foot dog nose. You also have the drive line running through um, from the engine to the rear axle underneath the bus. So it makes it a little bit harder to put a ton of storage, although schoolie builders make it work all the time. And, um, oh yeah, the big one for me, and I, I promise you, you can learn to drive everything, but 
for me, having the engine bay in front of you and having the tires in front of you um, makes it less maneuverable. It, it, it's not that it's less maneuverable, but there's less visibility. And that's a fact. There's less visibility. And so um, as you're maneuvering around things, you just get used to it. But for me, with the flat front, I can see everything right in front of me. If there's a curb or a rock that I'm I can see it right there and I can I can look back. Actually, I can stick my head out the window and I can look back and I can see what my my front tire is doing. And there's just so much visibility with the um, with the flat front bus. So that's the dog nose. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything and we'll move on to the front engine. Yep, the garage. OK, so you can build a garage in the back of your bus that you can access from the exterior with a front engine or a dog nose. It's a big plus to be able to get what's underneath your bed or to even make a full length top to bottom garage. And um, you, just, you just can't do that with the rear engine because the rear engine is in the way. All right, so let's move on to the front engine. The front engine has a lot of the same pros and cons as the dog nose. It has the increased visibility that I talked about. It does still have the drive line running underneath the bus. They tend to actually have great ground clearance as well. A, uh, a major um, downside to the front engine, and this is actually true of the dog nose too, but to a lesser extent, is that you have your engine compartment right next to you as a driver. And so that thing is creating noise and heat, a lot of it. And if you have passengers around you, um, they probably can't really hear you speak. And um, that makes it a little bit tough. You can definitely get headsets. You can do all kinds of things to mitigate that. But I think that's one of the major downsides to the front engine. Uh, and it's true of the, of the uh, dog nose as well, but to a lesser extent. You also, if you're gonna do maintenance or repairs, you have to basically do it in your living space. And um, for me, it's just easier to do it outside the bus. I'd prefer not to have that in there. But um, really the choice to go for a front engine is absolutely gonna come to the desire to have that garage in the back and the less length, because for whatever reason, they just don't put an engine in the back in a 28 foot school bus. But you can get a 28 foot front engine school bus. And I mean, that's basically like, like there's pickup trucks that are almost as long as 28 feet when you get a crew cab and an eight foot bed. So you definitely can bring that thing almost anywhere. Let me hit my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything for the front engine. Yep, dip, 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 dip. Perfect. Okay, so the rear engine is my bus of choice and it's for, especially for full-time travel. And it's for the reason that the engine um, being in the back means that you have the best ride experience. You don't have all that noise and heat and um, you don't have that experience of being like, you know, in the engine. You wanna be like, it's already kind of hard to drive a bus. You wanna be cruising around, really experiencing, I don't know, the sights and not so much the noise and the heat. But that being said, you will adapt to anything, so. The other thing is that you don't have the drive line underneath the bus and so, uh, by the way, if it's, I'm so sorry, I don't know if it's called driveline or drivetrain. So if I'm saying that wrong, my apologies. But you have so much space underneath there. They often have undercarriage storage, which is passed through, which is incredible to have. We fit so much stuff underneath our bus. And that kind of is our garage. Um, so we don't have access from the back, but we've got drive shaft. I didn't even, I said driveline or drivetrain and it's drive shaft. I'm so sorry. You guys will, if you guys hang out with me for a while, you'll know I'm not a super, like savvy engine guy. Like my first diesel engine was in our Gillig Phantom school bus. So just something you should know about me. I'm not like the pro. Um, so rear engine, yeah, it's really, it's just nice to have that engine in the back. And if you talk to, you know, coach people, like having an engine in the back just changes a lot of things for a lot of people. But I feel like I'm not selling it that much, but anyways, those are the three types and I'm not going to get super into there's, there's more, there's many more nuances, um, but I really want to talk to you guys instead of getting into the nuances. So um, I'm going to scroll through the chat, see if I missed any questions and you guys can drop your questions at any point. And um, here we go. All right. So first one was top joy. What do you think about coach conversion? What do you think about a coach conversion? So yeah, I think, so obviously you're going for a big bus, but a coach conversion has some major pros. You have tons of storage underneath that bus and 
having tons of storage means means that you can bring things like the freshwater tank, not have them in your living space. You can carry all kinds of ridiculous things. Like you want to put electric bikes underneath your coach bus, go for it. You can probably carry boats under there. Um, the only real pro, there's a couple cons. Uh, they are more expensive to purchase and they do tend to have two axles in the back. So you have eight tires to worry about. They do tend to have low ground clearance with long wheel bases. So when I think about a coach bus, I really think about something that stays on the pavement for the most part. Um, the way that we traveled, we went off the pavement a lot. I mean, you know, there's definitely lots of RV parks we stayed at where the 40 foot, you know, rear engine was like, it was challenging to navigate. A coach bus is going to be even worse. It's just, it's an even bigger bus, but I like them and lots of people like them. Okay, so Bethany asked, between the electrical and plumbing, which one do you find the most challenging to do and why? Okay, so the way that I do plumbing, um, I don't find it to be all that challenging because I buy PEX and I buy shark bite fittings and you can pull off a shark bite fitting. And so you basically have this like Lego set where you can change your plumbing and it might be a little bit more time consuming and it's more expensive. But the premise is really quite simple. You have water flowing into a tank. And if you'd like to add this, water flowing straight from the city into your plumbing fixtures and bypassing the tank. And then you have a 12 volt pump, which is pulling the water from the tank. And then it's feeding your cold appliance, your, your cold fixtures, and it's going to your water heater. And from there, it's going to the hot lines in your fixtures. And there's really nothing else to it. Um, if you look at my plumbing, it might look a little bit complicated to the complete novice, but there's it's very simple. Now there, once again, there's some nuances to plumbing, and um, you need uh, check valves, and you need a couple things more than just a vessel for water to flow through. But it's not that complicated. Electrical, uh, um, the actual wiring of the fixtures and wiring of the bus. The hardest part is picking the correct wires, the the correct and the safest wire sizes. And then once you get into the cabinet, it does get quite complicated. And to the, you know, to somebody who's never seen that before, it's going to look insane. But I can tell you that um, it's kind of like I, the way I see it is that you have a very complicated puzzle. You don't necessarily have a box to look at and you don't understand how the pieces fit together. But when you learn a section, like when you learn what AC distribution is and when, when you learn what a charge controller is, all of a sudden the puzzle starts to make sense. So electrical is definitely the most intimidating and likely the hardest thing um, conceptually to do on the bus. But actually, my least favorite is carpentry. It takes the most amount of time. Um, the work that I'm satisfied with is to a higher standard than I'm able to do usually. So carpentry is actually what I find to be the hardest, believe it or not. OK. Okay, Brandon's from Lakeland. It's hot there. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's really hot in Florida right now. I, I don't know how you guys do it in the summer. I saw, I, I witnessed the Bus Life story. If you guys know them, they are a family. Am I, I, do I have that right? Maybe it's the Bus Life. They have a family of like 10 or 11 or 12, and they did their second conversion in a grass field in Florida without even much electricity, and they just crushed it. Um, and I just, you know, I saw them sweating constantly and uh, they've got a YouTube channel and they've got a great conversion. It's one of my favorites. I believe it's called The Bus Life, but it might be called The Bus Life Story. Um, I'm shopping for a bus and about how much you think we should pay for a 40 footer. Um, so a 40 foot pusher, you know, I haven't been shopping this year. I was shopping in um, early 2021 and I was also shopping in 2017. And a 40 foot pusher was usually like a nice one with a high ceiling and possibly undercarriage storage was like seven grand. I think it's closer to eight to 10 now. Um, that being said, you can still find a bus cheaper, but I'm of the opinion that um, these buses, when they were built, you know, they cost more than a hundred grand. And oftentimes you're getting something that's, it's got so much life left. Like even if you're getting a, a bus with 200,000 miles, there's so much life left in that thing and paying 10% 10 10 of that conceptually i mean i know that actually having the money is very hard but conceptually it's like it's just not that crazy to spend 10 grand on the bus that you want bethany's got a 40 foot 
um, America, uh, all American bluebird. Those are really cool buses. Um, like that's just a, that's a top tier bus. Flat nose Thomas 34 foot. Yeah. I like it. Javier has got a Gillig phantom. All right. <laughs> that's sweet. Uh, we probably, if, if you have a Gillig phantom, I'm sure we've spoken, but I'm not great at remembering names perpetually. Brandon's got a front engine with 33 and a half feet. All right, let me get to the questions. Okay. Questions. Oh, hey, Katie and Sam. Thanks so much for being here, guys. You guys are sweet. Okay, Ant Antoinette asks, what is the best toilet to buy? Man, that is such a big question. Um, composting toilets, if you are a single person, are fantastic. If you are a couple, they're manageable. If you have a family, they're not my favorite. Um, but they do allow you to live off grid for the longest period of time. And even my family, um, although we route our pee to the gray tank, we spend um, close to a month before I have to dump that compost into a tank. But they're not, if you're a single person, it, it really does kind of look like dirt in there and it has time to dehydrate. Um, but just so you know, uh, if you've got a whole family, a compost and toilet is tough. Now you've got, and that's the only one I actually have any experience with. Now, having a blackwater tank, now that we've traveled for so long, I don't think it's that crazy to have a blackwater tank. You're going to have, you have to dump your gray water anyway, the same location you'd have to dump your black tank. So I know that I probably, I don't think I could go with a flushing black tank toilet. I don't think I could go a whole month um, living off grid, but I don't know. I might trade that. You know, it's not, I don't think it's that crazy anymore. Now you've got um, incinerating toilets. I think for the most part, those still use too much electricity to feasibly use in a bus conversion. You have um, toilets that um, bag and compress your material. I think those are great, but they're they're expensive to purchase and also use. You've got cassette toilets. I would never do that personally because you just have to dump it too often. Um, there's more types of toilets. I don't want to get too much into the toilets, but there's a lot. I think my favorite for a couple is the composting toilet. Okay. <clears throat> How are your windows holding up? Leaks. We are on, on the second round here to stop leaks. So Madison, if you watch all my videos, you'll know that I probably went through three rounds of preventing windows from leaking. And, um, the last round, I worked on the rubber seal between the glass and the aluminum pane. And um, if I have any moisture that comes in anymore, which I really, I don't often, um, only in the right rain conditions, uh, it's from those seals. So my, my windows don't leak. Um, I know that a lot of people are just into chucking the windows. Um, my windows are different than bus windows, but I do believe that most people will figure out how to get the windows to stop leaking. I mean, it's got to be possible. So just, yeah, it might take a couple rounds. All right. Hey, Dream on Wheels. Dimitri. <laughs> Building a van in Philly. How do I bulletproof it? All right. Well, I know that Dimitri is a friend of mine. I know that he doesn't really need the answer to that question. Um, the yeah, I think the the guy who, who made his own tank in Texas and then tragically went on a rampage, that's probably your guy. Or um, Ned Kelly. All right, this is way too off topic. Um, John has a 2002 Thomas Freightliner 35 foot, and he's almost done. Congratulations, man. You know what? 90% done is like there's still so much time that has to be taken. <laughs> But getting there feels so good. And you know what? When you're 95% done, like you can call it finished. You don't have to, you don't have to get to hundred. I don't think anybody does. Okay. Mohammed asks, how bad or poor is the ground clearance for a rear engine? So our rear engine has, I believe, 11 inches of ground clearance from its lowest point. And Katie and Sam's bus has, I think, 10 inches. And obviously we don't do crazy off-roading. Um, we would only go down something like a fire road or um, into a boondocking spot. And we haven't had any problems with that. I don't know why that is, but we went all over the country and um, yeah, it, it actually hasn't been an issue for us. Um, but if you, you know, if you're going to be going to Baja and you're going to be going um, on off-road most of the time, 
Like you want more ground clearance than 11 inches, I think. Oh, the sum of bus, Gillig windows. Yeah. So yours are leaking too? I mean, hit me up personally for that. Because like I can maybe I can help you work through that because we have the same windows. All right, guys, I'm not getting enough questions. I need I need questions from you. Is it dumb to think about insulating the cross members under the bus? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, you you generally need access to all the things underneath your bus and you don't want to trap moisture between the steel members of the bus and the subfloor. Um, I, 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 a, a lot of people think, can I just insulate underneath the bus and, you know, you can play around, but I don't think it's worth it. I forget about that idea. Like that's my honest opinion. Oh, this, okay. So you figured out your gilly window. So that's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely, Mohammed, the uh, the rear engine has served us very well. We have not, like, we. I, I don't think I've even bottomed out on anything. The hardest thing for me has been that wheelbase, that huge wheelbase. Um, I only hit something one time. I'm going to tell you guys a story now because you're not asking enough questions. But I only hit something once. And it was in a sort of like a, almost a boondocking spot. It was, it was like an unsupervised campground. And so those can get pretty... Um, unstructured is there? I don't know. Basically, like what happened was, I reached a dead end and I had to do a turnaround, and there was actually a turnaround, and it was way too tight to take the bus on. And there was a dumpster here, and there was a tree here, and I came around and I was like, no, nope, that's not going to work. I need to do something else, like back way over here. And um, so I started to back up, and I was watching the tree, and I was clear on the tree. And um, everything was cool. And then all of a sudden I heard a noise and I was like, no, what did I do? And it turns out at the bottom of the tree was a trunk that had been cut off. And so I scraped that trunk with my undercarriage door and I dented it a little bit. That's the only time that my ground, my, uh, my wheelbase actually was that detrimental to me. Um, but that's why when we were doing Canadian Sam's bus, we did two um, rear facing side view cameras so that you could actually see right along that part. And it's good to be able to see your tires when you're going to be hitting stuff. So it's crazy that you can actually make, you can make all this much more manageable by seeing more angles. And, um, so that's why we went for three, no, four rear view cameras for their bus. Okay. So the hope bus has a 45 foot MCI. I thought we'd be done in six months, two years later, and we are 70% done. I'm not surprised by that at all. I had the same thought. I was like, I can do this in six months. And part of it is because the scope of work changes. Like you, when you start, you're like, I'm going to just build out the interior and everything's going to be easy. And then all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I want like a couch that turns into a bed that has a projector that can be turned into a fort and everything gets more complicated and it takes way longer. And then also you just, you didn't know what you're gonna do. You didn't know what you're doing when you started. So yeah, I hope you finish soon. 45 foot MCI is a beast. And um, yeah, that's, that's a great, that's like a forever home right there. Did you have to paint the inside sheet metal of the bus? I did actually on Gilligan Phantom see, uh, if you're talking about the, the underneath, like the underneath the floor, yeah, like 99% of the time you're going to have to paint that um, because you want to protect it uh, after you've mitigated the rust. There's always going to be rust because um, these buses at some point will get cleaned out with water and moisture will get trapped. And um, maybe there's a bus out there with no rust at all. But if you see any, you got to mitigate it and then you're going to want to paint to protect it. Okay. Would you increase your water and gray tank sizes now that you've traveled? I love that question so much because um, I wouldn't have known the answer to that at all for a long time until recently, um, having traveled so much. Uh, we have 100 gallons of fresh and 100 gallons of gray, and I don't think I would increase them significantly. 
Now, those 100 gallon tanks are the cheapest tanks you're going to find. They're like 280 to 300 bucks. Sometimes you can get two for less than $600. And if you start to get more technical, it gets quite a bit more expensive. But if, especially if you have a beast of a bus like mine, 200 gallons of fresh is not insane. And I don't think I would go that much with the gray. Um, but you'd still need a lot of gray. And uh, as you travel, you know, it, it's actually the gray water that's usually the most limiting. It's usually easier to find fresh water than it is to find a place to dump gray water. So I'd increase them a bit if I wanted to, but I don't think you would go that much crazier. I know people have done 200 gallons. I haven't been able to remove the protective casing from the back of my 50 amp shore power inlet. It's it says to turn and pull, but it doesn't come off. I think I know what you're talking about. I don't remember. You have to turn it first. <laughs> I, you know, if you put it in my hands, I might remember how to do it, but my brain doesn't remember how to do that. I'm sorry. My 2002 Thomas Freightliner Cummins 5.9 would like to know, oh, I would like to know how to unlock the electronic cruise control. Mine is turned off. That is a question for a Cummins dealership. I would just get on the phone and call every Cummins dealership and figure out if it's something that they can do or it's something that maybe you can do. But I definitely don't know how to do it. Do you know what the registration process is in California? Yeah, that's another thing I have no idea because every single state has different laws. And um, I can only tell you about mine. So I'll tell you about mine. In the state of South Carolina, you have to take a bus and make it a motor home by adding like five out of seven or eight or nine qualifying items. So something to cook in, some water storage, some electrical source, like which even could be a generator, a bed. It was actually like a kitchen. It was it was actually very easy to, to meet those requirements. Now, I actually never drove my bus once I parked it before doing the conversion. Um, but when I had somebody come check it out, it was pretty easy for me. And if you would like to skip that whole thing, just Google the Vermont schoolie registration. So many people have done that effectively and you can basically register a schoolie in Vermont and not ever have to do anything, which is very cool. So um, to the gentleman who's in California or lady, um, man, I might even consider that as well because I'm sure California's registration process is the trickiest. Would you keep the original bus AC to cool while driving if it works? I would not because it's in my way and I don't care that much about AC while driving. Let's say driving is 10% um, of your life. If you have a fan blowing on you and airflow from the windows, I don't think you need AC. Now, if you only drive in Texas uh, and you only drive into the sun and you like, really need air conditioning, maybe that's a scenario where you keep the air conditioning. But for me, I'm traveling to places where the weather is nice. So I don't need to keep the air conditioning while driving. I've never missed it. What would you say is the max height you prefer for a bus considering a roof raise? Okay. Yeah. So um, I think the best reason to raise a roof is to get more insulation underneath the, in the floor of the bus, more insulation in general, because you want to have an easier to condition space. And that's especially important if you're going to be in cold areas. Um, so the answer to the question for a roof raise for me is, what is the um, height that I can raise it to that gets me an easy cavity to put all the insulation I want and then still have significantly more head space? Um, so I don't think I would ever make a bus taller than 12 feet. Uh, mine's like 10 feet. When I drive under bridges, I don't think about it and I don't want to think about it. But especially in the Northeast of the United States, there are plenty of bridges. Um, so I think 18 inches is good, 20 inches, 22. It also depends how long your bus is. If your bus is a 40 footer, it's you know a, bit, a little bit less crazy to raise it super high. But if it's a short bus, you're really changing. You're going to start changing the, the geometry of the bus and the ride. So 18 inches. Um, 
I have a rear engine 2002 Thomas. Started gutting everything out three years ago, but stopped and I gave up. School bus just sitting in my yard for four years. Tell me why. Like, why'd that happen? Um, tell us why. Because that was actually the topic of our first uh, school we support. And I think it's an interesting topic. And it's something that I want um, everybody to be able to avoid. Um, and if it's been sitting for four years, you know, why are you going to are you going to finish it or sell it? Like, let's talk about it. Guys, I'm out of questions. I didn't prepare any. Um, I didn't prepare any more stories. I didn't prepare the first story. There's 40 people here and none of them have questions. You can ask me anything you want to. You can ask me about YouTube. You can ask me about, you can ask me, I don't, I, I do lots of research about things that are not schoolies. I'd love to talk about like things that aren't schoolies as well. And if you're considering them, like if you're considering a van or a bus, I want to talk about it. If you're considering a truck camper, let's talk about it. Madison, okay, Madison Busman asks, do you have any issue finding insurance? Yes, and then no. Um, it's hard to call insurers and try and explain to them what you're doing. You're like, I'm, I got this bus, but it's not a bus anymore. It's a motorhome, but it doesn't look like a motorhome, and the, you know, the registration or the title doesn't say it's a motorhome. It can be tough to um, to find an insurance agent who will understand that. But it turns out that there is an insurance agent. I believe her name is Kelly Newsom at Allstate that totally gets it. And everybody in the schooly world that can't find insurance calls Kelly Newsom at Allstate. I'm going to Google that real quick. And I, somebody just passed us the number. Yeah, look at that. Kelly Newsom, Allstate. If, if, um, if Kelly ever stops working, we're just going to be... Hopefully she passes it off to somebody else. Okay, this is not... I'm just going to drop this in the chat. This is not a way to contact Kelly directly, but just so you remember the name, Kelly Newsom hooks it up. Kelly Newsom hooks it up. Kelly Newsom. Uh oh. Okay, I clicked on the wrong thing. All right, there it is. Okay, yeah, I got I got questions now. Thanks, guys. Oh, I got so many questions. Okay. Youngsters Clothing asks, what would be a good amount of solar power to run a complete build? I like anything more than 1600 watts. If I've got a short bus, 1600 watts. If you've got a medium sized bus, 2400. Got a full length, 3200. Um, I think all those are a good amount. I think 1600 is kind of the minimum, in my opinion, for a bus. And anything over 3200 is I think it's kind of not necessary, but it might be for your, your like your your particular needs. Do we have laws in regards to seats that are usable while driving? Um, I can't find any. I don't search for laws that I can't find. Um, I just use common sense. But I will tell you this: the safest thing to do in your bus is to have a floor mounted seat with a shoulder belt and a lap belt and have that bolted through the floor. Like you could take a minivan seat and do that with it and adapt it. Maybe not every minivan seat, but some seats. Um, besides that, I think you should have seat belts in your rig. Um, the best way to mount seat belts is to mount them to the actual bus chair rail that the rail, that the bus seats sit on when you disconnect them. So keeping access to that in your couch, I think is a good idea. And if you don't do that, I would bolt them through the floor with some really big washers and um, nuts and bolts. But I never made that video because I don't want to be responsible for things that um, directly are about safety. So definitely do your own research about that. And remember, the safest thing is to have that shoulder belt. Oh, and as far as laws, every single state is different. Um, some states require no seat belts in an RV. So as you're driving around, you know, be sure to just remember some, you know, if you're a person who runs around the bus while driving, some states that will be illegal. Um, okay, so getting a hitch on a rear engine bus is 
not it's usually not incredibly um, complicated. You, the only fabrication necessary might be drilling holes. I haven't done it, but it's definitely doable and it's not complicated. What's been your favorite place to stay? Yeah, uh, we loved Zion National Forest. Um, I love the whole, I, I, I just like water. So I love the whole Pacific coast. Um, I, I wanna be close to the ocean. Um, and there's a lot of free spots along the ocean as long as you are north of San Francisco. So I like that whole stretch. They're like, they're like free. They're, they're eye overlander spots. Um, but we loved Utah and Zion and uh, we were in Maine last summer. Love Maine. A lot of places. <laughs> Anything with water though. I just like, actually, you know what? Joshua Tree was a really cool experience too. So desert is cool too. It, the best thing is being able to see it all. Have you ever thought about having a CB radio? Um, no, I, I'm not even like well-versed in what I would do with one of those, but I do know that preppers want them. So they must be extremely useful to somebody. Now, now I, pr I probably should think about it now. Okay. Uh-oh. All right, lots of long-term campgrounds. Want less than 10-year-old campers. Yes, let's talk about this, Lone Wolf. Um, I don't rock up to, oh, long-term campgrounds, not short-term. I've never been to a long-term campground. I think there are going to be so many places that do not require a less than 10-year-old RV CA, whatever it's called, certification rig. I just wouldn't worry about that. I would find a place that was okay with my cool self-built alternative mobile dwelling. And when I was driving around in the bus, we never like searched, you know, Palm Springs RV resort. Like when we were trying to stay somewhere, it was always like, where can I stay for free near Palm Springs? Or what state or national campground is near there because state and national campgrounds they don't they don't discriminate against any kind of rigs i've never really had anybody um say you guys can't come in here with your bus uh, it actually happened one time when we were helping kels and jay so we ended up in a rv park that we wouldn't have normally looked for and um they actually <laughs> after i was like all right Pete, you know no worries they ran down the street to say you know we changed our mind it's okay um, but you you have to present yourself like um, somebody who's not going to trash their campground, um, which shouldn't be too hard to do. Have you done powder coating or painting the undercarriage of the bus? No, no, I don't have any rust underneath my bus. I am not looking for any extra work and you shouldn't be either. If you have a thought cross your mind and you're like, I'm 75% sure I can just forget about that problem. I would just do it because that's how you finish. Um, just don't create more problems for yourself, which is not a great answer to your question, but something that I think you should know. All right. Um, so Mohammed is a family in four, of four and a half. I guess that's a dog <laughs> or a pet. Considering doing part-time on the road, what's a decent size? We need separate space for sleeping and a small work workspace for working remote. You could go 40. I think you can make 35 feet work too, but anywhere between 40 and 35 feet, I think you'll be happy. I don't think I would go lower. I wouldn't go smaller, if you're, especially if you're going to be part-time. Okay, so now... I have a 40-foot Van Hool bus, and I want to put slide-outs on both sides. Have you researched that? Linda... That just sounds so hard to me. If I wanted slide outs, um, yeah, I mean, a 40 foot Van Hool, like there's a lot you can do. I know that you've got a huge gross vehicle weight rating. Um, I just don't, I, I, can't, I can't fathom extremely complicated things like that. that. Like, I feel like that would add a six month, that would be like a six month project for me. You've got to engineer it. You've got to figure out how to do it. I would just, I would probably buy a coach bus with, slide outs and then make sure I kept great care of it and then sold it for not too much of a loss and actually 
prices of rigs are kind of going up. So Madison asks, is it required to paint over the school bus yellow? In some states, yes, it is. In every state, no, it is not. Okay, this is a good question. Have you ever had issues with balance or weight issues or having having too many items like water tanks on one side? I definitely think about where I'm putting the weight, um, but you would really have to put it off balance. Like you'd really have to put everything on one side to at least with my bus to feel that. And so that's something that I avoided. Everything is very much the 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 water weight runs horizontal and then each side of the bus has a relatively similar amount of stuff, but I, I kind of like symmetry. So it happened just naturally. Tesla battery, good idea instead of a bunch of individual batteries. I don't think I would take a Tesla battery pack and uh, adapt it to your rig over buying um, new lithium iron phosphate cells from Alibaba or a reputable um, wholesaler in America and building my own battery pack, uh, especially because Tesla batteries, I believe, are lithium phosphorus, and it is a less chemically stable setup. I'm going life pope. I'm going lithium iron phosphate every time. Would you consider a Blue Eddy five kilowatt hour as a power source for the bus as opposed to all our solar equipment and lithium batteries? You would have to add. Yes, I would definitely consider that. Um, especially if I knew, if, okay, so if I had things like propane cooking, excuse me, propane water heating, and I didn't have a massive bus, and I didn't have serious electrical loads, I would definitely consider getting a pre-package, you know, like a Blue Eddy five kilowatt hour um, pack. I should, I should probably test something like that someday, um, because I could probably do that. But I would I would definitely like to just, you know, I, I think if you're in a van, I think you can probably make five kilowatt hours and a Blue Eddy work for a lot of stuff. OK. What was the hardest part of the building process? For me, that is always carpentry. It just takes so long and it's so tedious. And uh, and I actually I actually like the electrical and the plumbing. Uh, my favorite, my favorite part is demo. It's just the best. Uh, and um, when you get, when you have the right tools, demo is just, it's just so satisfying. Okay, White Whale Express asks if you didn't already cover it, what bus transmissions should people stay away from, and what transmission is preferred? Um, I actually want to talk about this more at length later. So, very quick answer. The AT545 um, can be, um, it's not a great choice for a full-size bus. If you've got like a 30 to 40 foot bus, um, the AT545 is not anybody's favorite. MT647, HT, and I don't, I haven't committed these things to memory lately, but basically Allison makes all the transmissions that we want and um, the HT647 and the MT647 and the MD3060, all three of those are really good. And the AT545 is totally fine, too, in a smaller rig. Yeah, OK. Can anyone help me? I, I like the words help me. If you say help me, I'm probably <laughs> I'm probably going to engage. Can anyone help me to get going? Repurchase of a midsize school bus. My rent and electric is now nine hundred and seventy five dollars. Yeah. Um, well, I can help you find one. Um, and I would suggest you look on publicsurplus.com, govdeals.org, Facebook Marketplace, and search all Craigslist. And I would scour the World Wide Web to find a great price on a great mid-sized school bus and be patient. And um, I'm sorry that your rent and electric is expensive like that. It's just all getting harder. Uh, Kendrick asks, uh, this is a great question for me because it means I get to disseminate information that's important to me. You do these lives every week at 8? Yes, I'm doing this live stream every week at 8 p.m. EST on Wednesdays. So Wednesday, 8 p.m. EST for approximately an hour unless I run out of questions. And each time I will, for the first 10 to 15 minutes, have like a theme, something that I just want to talk to you guys about. 
And um, that's basically the format for the foreseeable future. Okay, noise. So um, Home Flavor has a Thomas Safety Liner C2. Is that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the more modern Thomas with the sort of curvy, like the sort of slanted walls? If that's the case, then you've got a dog nose. And um, I think you need to check, you, you need to, in your, in your dog nose, you need to check your insulation and your noise proofing and make sure that it's there um, because there's these, there's these panels that they put there and they adhere all around it. And um, maybe it's compromised, um, but it would definitely be nice, I'm sure, for it to be less noisy. And it shouldn't be extremely noisy. Okay, cool question. Youngsters clothing. If you had to pay for the roof raise, what would be a fair price? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't think you're going to get a roof raise, a well done roof raise for less than $10,000. The labor is significant and the materials are significant. And if you watch, you guys should, all you guys should go watch um, Gutted. It's a TV show about van, schoolie, and RV conversions. And it's actually on its own distribution app called Blank Space. I'm going to type this into the chat. Blank Space app, period. You should watch Gutted. Um, you should watch Gutted because you get to see a live roof raise by a professional crew. Um, Wes from Transcend Existence has a shop in Kansas, in Kansas somewhere. And, um, and they do, they bang out a ton of roof raises and you can see how much work goes into it. And I think that 10, it, everybody used to say eight grand was an okay price, but I think now it's more like eight to 12. What's a good price for a mid-sized bus? I haven't been shopping lately, but five grand. Yeah. I feel like short buses might be quite expensive because people really want short buses lately. Do you and your family plan on traveling through Canada at all? Um, we, oh, my notifications is on. Yeah, I would love to come visit you in Canada. Um, we go to the Adirondacks quite a bit. And so we are close to Canada. And um, and we actually were at the tip of the Olympic Peninsula and you could see Canada from there. But for us, there is so much in the United States to see and do um, that we haven't planned to do it yet. Well, I'd love to, but. You know, like I said, I'm a warm weather guy, so it's going to be in July or August. And um, and that's it's kind of far from South Carolina. Bye, Mohammed. Thanks so much for being here. I'm glad you appreciated it. Oh, before you guys go, um, just because we're coming close to the end. So schoolie support is what I call these live streams. Like I said, every Wednesday, 8 p.m. EST. If you guys want one on one help with me, it's something that I'm doing right now. And you can go to schooliesupport.com to find out more. Basically, for a monthly, it's actually just a glorified Patreon. And for a monthly fee, if you need me, I'm in your back pocket at all, at all times. So that's the way that I'm doing consulting. And uh, I'm going back to the questions, though. Don't worry, don't worry, guys. So yeah, schooliesupport.com. Do you use anything for front engine bay noise cancellation like Kilmet? Uh, I have not used Kilmet. Um, Kilmet is it's definitely, um, I think it's definitely a good idea for an engine bay. If you put it all over your bus, I don't think it's a great idea because if you insulate with spray foam or have lock, you're going to be creating, you're going to be adding um, enough dense material to make the kill mat not super effective. But I definitely would um, put kill mat in that engine bay. But I, I, you're going to have to, somebody's done that on YouTube for sure. For sure. You should check that on YouTube. Do you have any favorite YouTube content creators that inspired you during or before your build? I think the one who inspired me the most was Bus Life New Zealand. Uh, Bus Life New Zealand is a family in New Zealand, and um, they were like they were sort of like down and out um, with their lifestyle and um, not super happy with their jobs, and they were overworked. And they did a really cool conversion, and um, and at the end, you get to see them take off as a family and just blossom as people. Um, that was probably my favorite bus lifer. And he actually just, so Bus Life New Zealand made videos from like 2016 to 2018 and then stopped and is now doing another conversion. Um, 
who else? Uh, the Bus Life story, which I mentioned earlier, um, they're a family of like 12 and they did a really great conversion. Beginning from this morning does incredible work. And uh, they're a little bit like they're a little bit more long winded. I like if you guys watch my videos, they're pretty rapid paced. That's because that's what I need to watch. I need I need like rapid paced um, stuff. So and there's there's more Bethany, but Bus Life New Zealand bus life story and beginning from this morning. I like all of them. Okay. All right. We got five more minutes. What you guys got? Youngsters clothing. Thanks for asking so many questions. I appreciate it. For a rear engine bus, do you need to do anything extra to ensure there's no carbon monoxide leaks into the bus? Um, by the time I'm done with my engine bay, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've taken some screws out. So I'm filling those screw holes with um, some kind of it and a sealant. Actually, in my most re in our wild caravan, we cut up roof flashing tape, which has aluminum on one side and like rubber bitumen on the other side, and stuck those down so that nothing would be coming through. And after that, you're going to be putting adhesive, you're going to be putting insulation, you're going to be putting plywood, and um, nothing's going to come through there for sure if you do that. We're looking to add underbus storage. Didn't come with it. What's the best way to add them without having to weld? Yeah, um, I have seen people really fight with, oh, okay, you don't need to do pass-through storage. Watch my video about um, undercarriage storage on our wild caravan. We got two 60 by 24 inch boxes off Facebook Marketplace. We paid about $700. We actually used Unistrut and bolts to mount them. Um, not the most professional way to do it, and I wouldn't recommend that if you're going to put a ton of weight in them, but to this day, they have held up just fine. So. That would be a no way, but I literally did that. Um, just our wild caravan undercarriage storage. You'll find it. Thanks so much to some of us. See you next time. Yes, Juan from beginning from this morning is meticulous. If you have the patience for beginning from this morning, you will learn so much. And that's not a knock at them. That's, that's me being impatient. Um, I actually watch YouTube videos now at two times speed. For the most part, that's how impatient I am. Am I, Bethany, am I, am I seriously, am I wrong? It's not called the bus life story. It's called good news bus. Yeah. Okay. So they are the good news bus, but their channel is the bus life, the bus life. Bye Carol. Thanks so much for coming. And yes, the Good News Bus did amazing builds. So the Good News Bus is doing their third build right now. They're doing it in a coach bus. I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. You guys should watch it. Could you repeat again where to find the better prices? Yes. Yeah, so if this is talking about where to buy a bus from, I'm going to type it in the chat. In the chat publicsurplus.com, boom, ofdeals.org, boom. Um, Facebook Marketplace, and search all Craigslist. Just Google search all Craigslist. And then you can, let's say you want, let's say you must have a Cummins 8.3 in your bus. You can go to search all, search all of Craigslist, type in um, school bus, Cummins 8.3, and find them all over the country. I, as you know, I travel for buses because I want them to be rust free from Arizona, New Mexico, maybe New Mexico, um, California. I, so that's kind of, I'm kind of shopping over there. Um, but you can definitely find rust free bu buses in other places as well. But, you know, there really is no rust over there. Thank you so much, Home Flavor. I'm glad you appreciate it. And thank you so much, Youngsters Clothing. It's funny to say your youngsters clothing over and over again. Okay, so um, hopefully I didn't miss you. If I missed you and it's important, drop it again. But we are coming up on an hour and I really appreciate you guys. Thank If you made it this long, wow. Thank you so much for watching me ramble for so long. And um, a lot of people I know have been watching me since 2017, and um, I really appreciate your support through all these years. Uh, just knowing that there is an audience for this is 
enough for me to at least come and talk about um, this topic with you guys. So thank you guys for watching and um, I'll see you next time. And uh, all mo mo most home bus, no worries. Just you can rewatch this and also you can join me next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Love you guys. Peace. That's how I end my videos, but end stream.